Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so we have been studying Majjhimanikaya Sutta number 12. This is the larger discourse, the greater discourse on the lion's roar. And last time, last time I was here, we went through the discussion of the ten powers of the Tathagata, ten special types of knowledge that pertain to a Buddha, and the four Vesarajas. These are the four types of self-confidence that the Buddha has. Okay, now we continue with this same discourse. And just to review that the Buddha spoke this discourse in response to an incident that took place. There was a monk by the name of Sunakata, a member of the Lichavi clan, who had disrobed, he left the Sangha, And he went around in the city of Vaisali denouncing the Buddha, saying that the Buddha didn't have any special powers of knowledge and no superhuman abilities. And this former monk, Sunakata, set a great deal of store, placed a great deal of emphasis upon two things, sort of his mark of a true spiritual master, One was the ability to perform miraculous feats, feats that went beyond the ordinary human ability. And the other was the practice of extreme ascetic practices. And so he saw that the Buddha practiced what we call the middle way, whereas he would look around, he would see some of the other Religious teachers were undergoing long fasts, subjecting their body to, bodies to all sorts of torments, but the Buddha wasn't practicing this himself and wasn't recommending this to his disciples. And so this made him disappointed with the Buddha. And then the Buddha wasn't openly performing miracles in front of the community And so this made him disappointed with the Buddha. And so for these reasons, he, well, before he disrobed several times, he came to the Buddha and challenged him and asked him to perform miracles and wonders in front of the community. And of course, even though the Buddha had such abilities, but the Buddha didn't try to convince others by performing wonders for them. But the Buddha would emphasize, this is not the purpose of my teaching. The purpose of my teaching is to reach liberation from suffering. If you practice this path, sila, samadhi, panya, morality, meditation, and wisdom, then you will gain liberation from suffering. <laughs> and so Sunakata got the impression what kind of Dhamma am I, have I gotten into? <laughs> no miracles, no asceticism, just liberation from suffering? What's that? And so then he went around in Vesali, the city of Vesali, saying, the Buddha teaches a Dhamma, all that leads to is liberation from suffering. That's all. And so now the Buddha is expounding to Sariputta some of his higher abilities 
that Sunakata was not able to appreciate. So he actually he went through the idis, the supernormal powers that he possessed. Then he went through the ten Tathagata powers of knowledge. Then the four grounds of self confidence. And now he comes to the eight assemblies. Now we're in paragraph 29 on page 168. Okay, and this shows by mentioning the eight <laughs> the eight assemblies, the Buddha shows the function of the four kinds of self-confidence, the four, here it's translated, intrepidities. Okay, what are the eight assemblies? He mentions an assembly of nobles, an assembly of Brahmins, an assembly of householders. Okay, By mentioning those three assemblies, the Buddha includes all of the lay community of India in that period. The Brahmins would divide the lay community into, they would put the Brahmins first, so the Brahmins at the head, then the nobles or Kshatriyas, then they would have the Vaishyas, those would be the merchants, the landowners, the cultivating class, then the shudras, those would be the laborers, the workers, the servants. And then below them, there would be the outcasts. But when the Buddha and the Buddhist texts speak about the lay community, they group everybody outside. The, they put the kshatriyas first because the Buddha was a kshatriya, the nobles, the Brahmins in the second place, and then they group everybody else together as simply as householders. Then outside the lay community are the ascetics, the renunciants, the sramanas, here translated the recluses. Then above the human world, There are the heavenly worlds. So there's the assembly of the gods who are under the rule of the four great kings. These are the four kings of the devas in the lower deva world. And so all of the devas under them are called the devas belonging to the heaven of the four great kings. Then Above them is the assembly of gods of the Tavatingsa Deva world. That's the gods of the 33. Their ruler is Chakra or Indra, the ruler of the gods. Then there are also other Deva worlds, but usually the Buddha doesn't visit them for some reason. But there's also Tusita. But for some reason the Buddha doesn't visit that Deva world. Then there's the assembly of Mara and Mara's followers. And then the assembly of Brahmas. Brahmas are the high deities. Above the Deva world, there are the Brahmas. The Brahma world is the world which is available, accessible through the jhanic meditative states. And so the Buddha says that he is able to approach and enter these eight assemblies because he possesses these four kinds of self-confidence. He has the self-confidence through fully awakening, becoming fully enlightened to all dharmas, all spiritual principles. He's self-confident 
because he's destroyed all the defilements. He's self-confident in that he knows everything which is an obstruction to spiritual progress. And he teaches whatever he teaches to be an obstruction is truly an obstruction. And he has the self-confidence of knowing that he teaches a path that when put into practice will lead to liberation from suffering. And so the Buddha says that possessing these four grounds of self-confidence, he approaches and enters these eight assemblies. And so he says he recalls having approached and entered many hundred assemblies of nobles, hundreds of assemblies of Brahmins, of householders, of recluses, the various assemblies of the Devas and Brahmas. And when he enters these assemblies, he sat together with them, he spoke with them, he conversed with them, and he never felt any fear or timidity, never had any sense that he could be defeated in debate or in discussion. And so when he sees no ground that any fear or timidity will come over him, for this reason he says, I abide in safety, fearlessness, and self-confidence. Okay, then there comes a repetition of that statement that seems pretty strong. The statement that comes originally in paragraph 21. When I know and see thus, should anyone say of me that the ascetic Gotama does not have any superhuman states, any distinction or excellence in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, that he teaches a doctrine that he simply worked out by reasoning, unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind and relinquishes that view, then, as surely as if he had been carried there, he will wind up in hell. Again, I have to say the statement seems rather strong to me too. But I think the idea here is that the former monk Sunakata, who was making that statement, was doing so with a mind of hatred and antagonism towards the Buddha. And his purpose was to sway other people and lead them away from following the Buddha's teaching. And he was doing so with a strong commitment or conviction that the Buddha doesn't have any superhuman states. So that's my understanding of that statement. Any questions on this point? At this point? Okay, now we go on to what are called the four kinds of generation. These are four modes or four ways in which beings, living beings, are born. So here the text says that there are these four kinds of generation. So what are these four? One is called egg-born generation, womb-born, then there's womb-born generation, moisture-born generation, and spontaneous generation. Okay, and then the next paragraph explains what are these types of generation. Okay, egg-born generation, these are beings that are born by breaking out of the shell of an egg. 
Okay, womb-born generation. Okay, these are beings that are born by coming out from the womb. What is moisture-born generation? These are beings that are born in rotten fish, a rotten corpse, rotten porridge, in a cesspit, in a sewer. This is called moisture-born generation. And then there is spontaneous generation. Okay, the devas or gods are spontaneous. Spontaneous generation means being born without parents, without any other medium of birth. Just one immediately comes into being, just like that. So the beings that are spontaneously born are devas or gods. The beings in hell. And then the text says, Certain human beings, spontaneously born, and some beings in the lower worlds, probably in the realm of the ghosts, pray to world, are spontaneously reborn. This is called spontaneous generation. So some people, I think last week or last time, asked me, How could there be human beings that are spontaneously reborn? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) I don't have first-hand experience. (laughs) I've never been standing in a room and seen a, a being come suddenly emerge out of nowhere. Well, I've seen that, but... There was an elevator there. (laughs) There's no further explanation in the text. So I don't know, it's just that the text mentions this as a possibility. Anybody have any ideas about it? I don't, but I'm curious about the location of this discussion in the larger sutta. Yeah. If you can speak about that, why he's going into this at this point. Okay, why he's going into that, into this at this point. It's an interesting question, especially since it's followed by that strong statement, when I know and see thus, should anyone say of me that, you have to fill in the words, that the recluse Gotama does not have any superhuman states, any distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, and so on. This is supposed to be another example of the superhuman knowledge and vision of the Buddha to be able to know and determine these four kinds of birth. And also I have to say what strikes me as a little problematic is the moisture-born generation because beings that are born from rotten fish, rotten corpse, and so on, are also born from eggs, we know today. (laughs) So maybe the distinction is that the beings that are said to be born from eggs are born by breaking out of the shell of an egg, whereas insects that are born and other types of minor life forms that are born from, say, a rotten fish or rotten food and cesspits and sewers. Though they're born from eggs, but they don't break out of the shell of an egg. But the eggs are so small that I don't know how they emerge from the egg, but it's not breaking out of the shell of an egg that we can see. Now, I wonder whether this classification also is very unique to Buddhism or whether this could be a common Indian classification which was incorporated into the sutta. This is a question I don't know. I think I've seen this classification in another Indian text, a non-Buddhist Indian text. 
So it doesn't seem to be especially unique to Buddhism. Yeah, George. Has any mythology grown up over humans being spontaneously born? There's quite, yeah, okay, the question is whether any mythology has grown up over being human beings being spontaneous re, spontaneously reborn. In India, there's quite a mythology about human beings being spontaneously reborn. Um, I think in later Buddhism, I know in the Tibetans believe there was a, the one of the Indian founders of Buddhism in Tibet, Padmasambhava. The name Padmasambhava means one who originates from the lotus flower. And the legend is that, or the belief is, whether it's legend or fact, I don't know, that he was born from a lotus flower. So that would be an example of one who was spontaneously reborn. And I think probably in Hinduism there might be also accounts of human beings who were born spontaneously. But it's a subject that I haven't investigated, so I can't don't, can't make authoritative pronouncements on it. It seems it would make a good subject for somebody's doctoral dissertation. <laughs> the spontaneous rebirth type, spontaneously reborn human beings in Indian Buddhist literature. Okay, then we'll move on to the five destinations and Nibbana. Okay, in Pali, the word here that's translated destinations is the word gati. I write this. The word gati comes from the root gam, which means to go. So the five destinations are the places to which one goes, to which one goes by way of rebirth. So these five destinations are the hell realms, the animal realm, the praetor realm or the realm of ghosts, human beings, and then the devas, the realm of the gods. And now the Buddha makes a statement which shows his understanding of these realms and of the way that leads there. He makes the same statement with regard to each of these realms. He says, I understand hell and the path and way leading to hell. And I understand how one who has entered upon this path with the breakup of the body after death, will be reborn in a state of deprivation and an unhappy destination in the lower world, in hell. Then he says, I understand the animal realm and the path and way leading to the animal realm. And I understand how one who has entered this path on the dissolution of the body after death will reappear in the animal realm. And then the same statement is made about ghosts, the human realm, and the realm of gods, the deva realm. Then in the sixth place, the Buddha says, speaks about Nibbana, the state of liberation. He says, I understand Nibbana and the way and the path and way leading to Nibbana. And I also understand how one who has entered this path will, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, 
here and now enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. Okay, and now continuing, the Buddha is going to illustrate how he can apply this understanding to particular individuals at particular times, particular occasions in their life. Okay, by encompassing mind with mind, that is, the Buddha uses his own mind to understand the mind of another person. And then he can know that this person is so behaving, so conducting himself, not only in his outer actions, but also by way of his state of mind. And he has taken such a path that on the dissolution of the body, after death, he will be reborn in the state of deprivation that is in hell. And then later on, using his divine eye, he will see that this person, after death, has been reborn in the hell realm and is experiencing exclusively painful, racking, piercing feelings. Then the Buddha illustrates this with a simile. He says, suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height, full of coals, glowing coals, and then a man scorched and exhausted by hot weather, very thirsty, came along. Then we have this phrase here, going in one way only and directed to that same charcoal pit. And this expression that's translated here, going in one way only, In Pali, this is a kayane, a kayano mugo. This is the expression that comes in relation to satipatthana, which is often translated as satipatthana being the only way for the purification of beings. But one could see that it actually means going in one way only. So satipatthana is called a kayano mugo, not in the sense that it's the only way for the purification of beings, but it's the way that goes, a path that goes in one way only. There's a path that goes directly or straight towards the purification of beings. Okay, so coming back to the sutta. So we have this in the simile, this path is going in one way only, straight to that charcoal pit. And then a man with good sight is observing this man walking on that path. And he knows that this man is walking along in such a way that if he just continues going in that same direction without changing course, he's going to fall into that charcoal pit. And then later on he'll see that this man has fallen into the charcoal pit and is experiencing very painful feelings. And so then the Buddha says by, in the same way, by reading another person's mind with my own mind and observing his behavior, I could see that he is behaving in such a way that if he continues in this way, he's on the breakup of the body after death, he will be reborn in hell. And 
what kind of behavior is going to lead to rebirth in hell. Usually this, or invariably, this will be behavior that violates the ten courses of good action, but probably especially it will be behavior motivated by strong hatred. Usually strong hatred that, in my understanding, that will result in a lot of pain and suffering for others. Okay, now, basically the same pattern is now applied to the case of another person who's behaving in a somewhat different way. So the Buddha applies his mind to understand the mind of this person, and he sees that this person is behaving in such a way that with the breakup of the body on death, He will be reborn in the animal realm. And then he sees for a fact that on the breakup of the body after death, this person has been reborn in the animal realm. And here he's experiencing, here the feeling is described not as exclusively or extremely painful, racking and piercing, but it's described simply as painful, racking, piercing feelings because the suffering in the animal realm is not as extreme as the suffering in hell. And the simile is different. Here is the simile of a cesspit. And so a man comes along, he's, again, he's thirsty and he's walking by a path in one direction heading straight for the cesspit, and then he falls in. In the third case, third simile, or the third case of the third person, the Buddha observes his mind and sees that this person is behaving in such a way that after death, he will be reborn in the realm of the pratas. Here it's translated as ghosts. Maybe I'm not so happy with the translation as ghosts since we usually think of ghosts as figures that haunt the house. But the pratas are a realm, a separate realm of existence of beings who are somewhat disembodied, though they do have physical bodies, but it's a very subtle kind of body. And they're subject to suffering, intense suffering, but it's not as extreme as the suffering in hell. They're usually depicted as subject to strong hunger and thirst, which they cannot satisfy. Okay, so the Buddha observes this person behaving in such a way that they're heading towards this realm. And then at a later time, he sees that this person has in fact been reborn in the realm of ghosts and is experiencing such painful feeling. And what is the type of behavior that leads to rebirth in the realm of ghosts? Again, it's action that violates the ten courses of unwholesome behavior. But it's usually considered to be extreme selfishness or miserliness, extreme avarice or clinging to possessions, refusal to part or to to give or resentment against the good fortune and success of others. Okay, then here the simile is that of a tree growing on rough ground and the tree has only scanty foliage 
So it gives a dappled shadow. And then a man comes along, very wary and thirsty, heading towards that same tree. And if he wants to get some relief from his weariness and thirst, and he sees that tree, and he tries to get some coolness from the tree by relaxing in the shade of that tree, there's not much shade cast by that tree. That's an illustration for the suffering in the realm of the pretas. It's not extremely intense misery and suffering, but it's like one doesn't get much relief there. (laughs) Okay, now we come to the pleasant realms or the realms of good fortune, the human realm and the heavenly realms. First, the human realm. The Buddha is observing a person behaving, conducting himself in such a way that on death he would be reborn in the human realm. And then later on he sees that this person has been reborn in the human realm and is experiencing much pleasant feeling. This must be somebody who's been reborn in a more favorable state of existence under more favorable conditions in the human realm. Of course, today there are many unfavorable opportunities for rebirth in the human realm. Disease, hunger, poverty, hard labor, unemployment, disease, warfare. But somebody who is born under fairly comfortable conditions. So suppose here's, and then later the the Buddha observes this person, reborn as a human being, enjoying, experiencing much pleasant feeling. Then this is illustrated by the simile of a tree growing on even ground, not rough ground, like in the case of the ghost realm with thick foliage casting a deep shade. And then a man, scorched and exhausted by hot weather, weary, parched and thirsty, came by a path going in one way only and directed to that same tree. Then a man, okay, so we could see that this, since this tree has thick foliage and casts a deep shade, we could see that if a man is thirsty and wary, he's going to be able to relax under that tree and enjoy the coolness of the shade. And so then a man with good sight sees him and knows that this man is going to arrive at that tree and will experience much pleasant feeling. In the same way, the Buddha encompasses the mind of that person and knows that person will be reborn in the human realm and will experience much pleasant feeling. Okay, now we come to the heavenly world. And so the Buddha Okay, and what is the kind of action that will lead to rebirth in the human realm? This will be generally following the ten courses of wholesome karma. Or doing deeds, meritorious deeds, though usually not perfectly, but not to a very high degree. Okay, now comes the rebirth in the heavenly realm. The Buddha sees another person and sees them behaving in such a way that on the breakup of the body after death, he will be reborn in the heavenly world, the happy destination. 
And then the Buddha sees this person with the breakup of the body after death, reborn in the heavenly world and experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings or extremely pleasant feelings. And then he illustrates this by the example of a mansion with a very well-constructed upper chamber with a couch, with rugs, blankets, sheets, and so on. And then a man came along, scorched and thirsty, scorched and exhausted by the hot weather. And he came by a path going straight to that mansion. And a man seeing him would know that this man is going straight to that mansion. And then later he will see that this person is sitting or lying in the upper chamber of that mansion, experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. Okay, so that illustrates rebirth in the heavenly world. And what is the type of action that leads to rebirth in the heavenly world? Again, it's following the ten courses of wholesome action, following them to a higher level, observing them consistently, or performing meritorious deeds, generosity, morality, practicing the virtues like loving kindness, compassion, but not yet developing wisdom, not developing developing it to a superior degree. Okay, now we come to the sixth stage. This is the attainment of liberation. You could say the realization of Nibbana. Okay, so now the Buddha says, by encompassing mind with mind, I understand a certain person thus. This person so behaves, so conducts himself, has, such, has taken such a path that by realizing it for himself with direct knowledge, he here and now will enter upon and dwell in the liberate, in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. Notice that this is not an attainment that's going to take place with the breakup of the body after death, but this is an attainment that's going to take place here and now. That means in this very life an attainment that this person will realize right in this very life itself. And this is going to take place through, through or with the destruction of the taints, with the destruction of all of the defilements. And then later on, the Buddha sees that this person has realized with direct knowledge here and now this liberate, this deliverance of mind, de deliverance by wisdom through the destruction of the taints and that he is, that he's experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. Suppose, then he uses a simile. Suppose there were a pond with clean, clear water, cool water, transparent, with smooth banks, delightful, and nearby a dense woods. Then a ma again a man comes along, scorched and thirsty, Came by, he comes by a path going in one way straight towards that pond. 
then a man with good sight sees him and says, this man is going in such a way that he will come to this same pond. Then later on, he sees this man and sees that he has plunged into the pond, bathed, drunk, drunk the water, and he's relieved all of his distress, fatigue, and fever. And he has come out and he's sitting or lying in the woods experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. So all of this, this is to illustrate the bliss of liberation, the bliss of attainment of Nibbana. And so this is supposed to be a higher degree of bliss than that illustrated by the pleasure of relaxing in the upper chamber of the mansion. Of course, now one has the pond in which one can bathe, wash oneself and drink, and one has the natural beauty of the woods in which one can lie down, and it's much nicer than just relaxing in the upper chamber of a mansion. And so this illustrates the excellence, the superiority of the liberation of mind, the liberation by wisdom. Okay, then it says, these are the five destinations. So I should say, these are the five destinations and Nibbana. Though even the Pali text just says, these are the five destinations. Okay, then the Buddha, again, he winds up by making that same statement that if anybody, when the Buddha has this knowledge, if anybody should say that he doesn't have any kind of superior knowledge and vision, that he teaches a doctrine that he's merely worked out through his own reasoning, then unless he abandons that assertion and that state of mind, and relinquishes that view, that is, if he keeps on holding to that view, keeps on maintaining that state of mind and presenting that assertion, then he will (laughs) wind up in hell. Okay, at this point I'll ask whether there are any questions. Yes, June. Uh, What is hell in Buddhism? Okay, the question, what is hell in Buddhism? Okay, according to Buddhism, there are these five realms of existence. And these realms are not just purely metaphors or symbols, but these realms have a kind of actual existence. But these realms are impermanent states of existence into which living beings are reborn as a result of their karma. So when beings perform karma, that is volitional action, of the type that is appropriate or attuned to these particular realms of existence, then they will be reborn into the realms of existence that exist as the appropriate sphere for the um, for the fruition of their karma. So in Buddhism, hell hell is a realm of extreme pain and suffering, and so those beings who perform extremely strong unwholesome karma. This would be karma actions that are rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. But for hell, I would think especially karma that's rooted very strongly in hatred. Through that karma, they will be reborn in the hell realm. And then they will undergo pain and suffering in that realm. that suffering will be the maturation of that unwholesome karma. And when that unwholesome karma is fully matured, fully 
when it fully exhausts its fruit, then they will pass away from the hell realm and then take rebirth elsewhere. And so we, we could say that the realms of rebirth in Buddhism are not realms of reward and punishment since there's no deity that stands outside of the, the different realms of rebirth that is rewarding the good people for their good deeds and punishing the bad people for their unwholesome deeds. But through a natural law of causation, of moral cause and effect, those who do unwholesome deeds propel themselves into the realms of suffering. And then their unwholesome deeds bring the suffering upon themselves. They bring these states of misery and suffering upon themselves. And then when the misery and suffering has brought its fruit, then they pass away from those realms to take rebirth elsewhere. Similarly, for the heavenly realms, those who do virtuous, meritorious deeds are reborn in the heavenly realms as a result of their meritorious karma. Then they enjoy their the fruits of their meritorious karma through the good, the desirable results of a heavenly rebirth, long life, a lot of bliss and pleasure, power, good health, radiant bodies. And then they'll enjoy that good result for a long time until they've fully exhausted that good meritorious karma. Then they pass away from the heavenly realm again to take rebirth elsewhere. And it's said that the human realm is something like the central processing agency (laughs) where eventually beings come back to the human realm and then create new karma which will lead them to other realms within samsara. Yes, Philip. Okay, the question, isn't it said that there are 31 realms of existence? There are actually said to be 31 realms of existence. The 31 realms of existence are obtained by making finer distinctions in the heavenly realms. So we have the hell, the hell realm, the animal realm, the praetor realm, the human realm, and then the deva realm or the he- heavenly realms. But then the heavenly realms get divided into six sense fair heavenly realms. Then we come to the Brahma worlds, which get divided into something like 15 Brahma worlds, a number of, what are these called? The pure abodes. Then there are four formless realms or immaterial realms. So when you add all of them together, then you get 31 realms. But here, In this presentation, in this sutta, all of these deva realms are all just collapsed into one and they're all just treated as the deva realm. Linda, did you? What type of behavior would land a being in the animal realm? You mentioned. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or um, the hungry ghost, because people often remark when they observe some animals that their behavior is almost human. How did they get there? Okay. I understand since basically that animals have a very dull existence, it's hard for them to pass out of the animal realm. Okay, okay, good question. The first question is what kind of behavior would land a person in the animal realm? And then on top of that, there was the comment that sometimes animals have behavior such that we say that that animal is behaving in such a human way. (laughs) Um, It would seem to me that the type of behavior that would land a person in the animal realm would be what we call very animal type behavior. That would be behavior very much concerned just with the gratification of one's animal desires just 
a very narrow concern with enjoying food and sexual pleasure. Um, and not much concern with developing one's higher, specifically human faculties. This is my conjecture. The texts usually just speak about the th- ten courses of unwholesome karma as leading to the hell realm, the Praetor realm and the animal realm without specially emphasizing one type of behavior as leading to one realm rather than the other. But I would think that it would be more brute animal behavior leading to the animal realm. But there's such differentiation in the animal realm, so many different types of animals that I would think that there are many different types of behavior that would lead to different types of animal existence like A cow is very much just concerned with eating, satisfying its desire for food, but it's very gentle and generally harmless. Whereas a wolf or a tiger is quite ferocious. So I would think a human being who is tiger-like or wolf-like, quite ferocious, but not so bad as to get a a hell-like rebirth, might be reborn as a wild animal like a wolf, a tiger, a lion, or as a human being who is just sits in front of the television, flicking, (laughs) watching the sports, munching on (laughs) snacks, (laughs) might be heading for an animal rebirth. (laughs) <laughs> These are just my guesses. I'm not, I'm not in authority on this. Um, then what you say about once one gets reborn as an animal, it's very difficult to get anim- out of the animal realm. That is what is said in the suttas, that why it's so important to avoid the animal realm, because once one gets into the animal realm, it's very, very difficult to get out of the animal realm because the passions of the animal are what dominate its behavior, its conduct, its its thoughts. And so its mental life, it's dominated by these forces of animal existence. And so once one is reborn there, it becomes very difficult to get out. But you say animals do exhibit human traits. So I would think that Sometimes when animals do show especially worthy traits, sometimes the capacity for self-sacrifice, consideration for others, that could be perhaps the wholesome volition that will lead it out from the animal realm back to the human realm. That is my, my speculation. Yeah. Why did the Buddha did not mention uh, six realms of existence? Yeah, why not six? In the old suttas, one finds only five realms are mentioned as separate realms. But one finds still in the old suttas a mention of a sixth type of being called the Asura. The Asuras are depicted as existing they're like neighbors of the Tava Tingsa Devas. They're neighbors of the gods of the 33 who are engaged often in a kind of war with the gods of the 33. Um, so there's, in certain suttas, especially in Sangyutta Nikaya, one reads often of the battles between the Asuras and the Devas, the Tavatingsa Devas. But the Asuras are not yet depicted as a separate class of beings. But then at some point later on, the Asuras then become divided off and spoken of as a separate class of beings. But this is 
the development that takes place maybe at a somewhat later point than the very early suttas. Suppose there are five realms of existence. Yeah. Which realm will also belong? God? It's a good question because The, there's a sutta, the Ratana Sutta, speaks of chat, the Ratana Sutta, the Sutta Nipata, chatu ha payehi cha the four states of misery. So then the Azura plane gets spoken of as the plane of misery. When the commentators speak about it, they say the Azuras are the pl- fourth plane of misery. But then the Azuras are not really shown as existing in such misery. They're almost like the Devas of the 33, like the Tavatingsa Devas, just a little bit rougher, They're a little bit like rough cowboys, <laughs> but almost like the Devas of the 33. So then the commentators say that the Azuras that are classified as the fourth plane of misery are not the Azuras that are fighting with the Devas of the 33, but these Azuras are another type of being that exists in the Praetor realm, part of the Praetor realm. But that explanation isn't so convincing to me. Because then it would seem that if they're part of the Praetor realm, why break them off and call them a, a separate realm? So I don't really know. <laughs> I just don't have an answer. It seems to me that the, originally the Asuras was something like a subdivision of the Devas of the 33, the Tavatings of Devas. But they have enough difference so that later on they just got separated off to become another realm. Okay, somebody here had a question? Peter? Yeah, the word merely before hammered out by reasoning, it's in square yeah. brackets. Is that an editorial edition? That's an editorial edition, yeah. And, I, and I'm wondering, I mean, I, clearly you, you don't want to say that the Buddha was wanted to distance himself from reasoning. So it merely means it's reasoning plus, plus the superhuman knowledge, right? But I'm wondering, and I guess it's not, I guess it's, it would be unattractive to think of it without the word merely in there, right? So, so Okay, the question is, does the word merely that's added here in brackets imply that there's some kind of devaluation of reasoning? You see, in amongst the teachers of the Buddha's period, there was a group of teachers who were known as the Mangsakas, which we might translate this as the rationalists. These were teachers who did not claim to be teaching a doctrine based on any kind of super sensory meditative insight, but they claimed to be teaching their doctrine on the basis of their reasoning, their intellectual investigation. And they would just use the power of thought, the power of reasoning to work out their doctrine. And so the Buddha wanted to separate himself from that group of te- teachers. One group of teachers were the traditionalists, like the Brahmins, who taught their doctrine on the basis of a traditional revelation, like the Vedas, which was handed down by tradition through a lineage of teachers. Then there were the rationalists, who used reasoning, um, logic to develop their systems of thought. And then there were the teachers who taught on the basis of 
abhinya, a higher meditative experience, higher meditative insight. And the Buddha classified himself with those teachers who taught on the basis of insight through higher meditative experience. One sees these groups, I think it's Machimunikaya Sutta number 100, these distinction of it comes in 100 but I think it, it, I have to say I think the transmission of one sutta number 100 got mixed up um, sutta number 76 one finds the groups Yeah, Sutta number 76, one finds the groups distinguished more clearly. Sutta number 76, paragraph 24, one has the traditionalists. In paragraph 27, one has the rationalists. And they are said to teach a spiritual life that is without consolation where in a wise ma- where in a wise person would not live the spiritual life or if he should live it he would not find the true way the way the dhamma that is wholesome because it's not based on direct experience A lot makes sense on on the basis of reasoning, but eventually the reasoning has to lead to direct experience, direct realization. Okay, I think we'll have to stop now. And then next week, we'll complete the sutta. Okay, we end with the dedication of the merits. (laughs) Akasa ta chabuma ta Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Nanumodiva Chirang Rakantu Sasanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Nanumodiva Chirang Rakantu Desanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumodiva Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Etavata Chaam Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Deva Anumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Etavata Chaam Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Bhuta Anumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya